New Leadership Runs Russia, The Russian Revolution. As World War I began, Russia was woefully behind the rest of Europe in just about every aspect of life. This was because the Romanov family, who ruled Russia from the beginning of the 1600s, were autocrats, or absolute monarchs, and controlled every aspect of life for the Russian people. The czars, the titles for the leaders of Russia before the war, had complete control over the government, religion, they were the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church, military, and society. Tsar Alexander II did try to make some changes in the 1850s, but he was assassinated when some people decided that his reforms did not go far enough, fast enough. His son, Alexander III, witnessed what happened and was convinced that the only way to prevent something like the assassination of leaders again from happening in the future was to impose complete control of the people again. He increased the power of the secret police, restored strict censorship or government control of the media, and exiled his critics to Siberia. He began a process of Russification, which tried to eliminate the cultures of the non-Russians within the Russian Empire. Alexander insisted on the only language being taught and spoken was Russian. There was only one church, the Russian Orthodox Church. And so, as the rest of Europe was leaving the days of absolute monarchy and feudalism far behind, Russia was embracing it even more. This led to the persecution of many groups inside Russia, but particularly the large number of Jewish people who had fled Western Europe during the Middle Ages because of religious persecution there. The Tsar limited the number of Jewish people who could study at universities or work at certain jobs. He brought back old laws that limited the places that the Jewish people could live. These restrictions brought about a series of pogroms or violent mob attacks on Jewish people. And once again, the Jewish people were forced to flee, looking for a place where they could be free and safe, which ultimately brought many of them to the United States. In 1884, Tsar Nicholas II succeeded his father as leader of Russia, but it was a position he did not really want. However, he decided to continue many of the policies and practices of his father. On the plus side, this meant increased attention to catching Russia up industrially with the rest of Europe. Russia had plenty of natural resources, including land and minerals, and a large peasant population that could serve as workers in the factories. The problem was that Russia did not have enough wealthy people to invest their capital, their money, in starting these factories. As the government began to encourage economic development in the 1890s, primarily by encouraging the building of railroads to connect iron and coal mines across the country, to factories, and to transport goods across the country, a wealthy industrial class developed with the help and interest in helping Russia develop industrially. The landowning nobles, however, opposed the economic development, fearing the changes that it might bring. Peasants left their jobs farming the land of these nobles for the promise or hope of a better life in the factories. All they found were long hours and low pay in dangerous conditions. In the slums around the factories, poverty, disease, and anger multiplied. Radicals who wanted changes in the government stood outside the gates of the factories, passing out pamphlets that included the ideas of Karl Marx, the author of the Communist Manifesto, who believed that the future of Russia was in a government that repre represented all of the people and eliminated the czars and the nobles. The beginning of the end for Tsar Nicholas II was Russia's loss to Japan in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904. For the first time, an Asian nation had defeated a European nation in battle. Russians began to lose faith in the Tsar, and workers went on strike, demanding shorter hours and better pay, while reformers called for a new constitution and changes to the government. 
on Sunday, January 22, 1905, an Orthodox priest led a march to the Winter Palace, the home of the Tsar in St. Petersburg. Believing that the Tsar would help his people if he only knew how bad things were for them. Instead, the Tsar fled the palace and called out guards to defend it. As the marchers drew closer, shots rang out, killing or wounding hundreds of men and women, as victims stumbled away, saying, The Tsar has deserted us. In the months that followed Bloody Sunday, the Tsar would be forced to make sweeping reforms in response to the nationwide strikes, takeovers of local government, peasant demands for land, and assassinations of government officials, those assassins being praised as heroes by the public. Nicholas II agreed to summon a Duma, or elected national legislature, that he claimed would approve any law that he made before it went into effect. This quickly won moderates to his side, and left socialists and radical reformers powerless. However, Nicholas dissolved the first Duma when its leaders dared criticize him and the government. Many more Dumas met between 1906 and 1917, but did little to stop the simmering unrest that existed in the country. In March 1917, three and a half years into World War I, there were food riots and strikes in St. Petersburg. When the Tsar ordered his soldiers to step in and prevent that from happening, the soldiers joined the rioters instead. The Duma proclaimed itself a provisional government, and with that the Tsar decided to abdicate or give up the throne. Andrew Kerensky took over the government and decided that the best thing to do was to try and win the war against Germany. When he told the military leaders to launch what became a disastrous offensive against the Germans in July 1917, the people of Russia decided it was time to change governments again and turned to a new political voice in Vladimir Lenin to turn their fortunes around. Lenin was a believer in the teachings of the socialist economist Karl Marx. Marx believed that eventually the workers of the world would unite and overthrow the wealthy capitalists and run their own businesses. In 1895, Lenin had been arrested for spreading those Marxist ideas. He lived in exile in Switzerland until the Tsar stepped down and then was smuggled back into Russia by the Germans who were looking to weaken the Russians from the inside. In November of 1917, squads of Red Guards from the Soviets, or local governments established by groups of workers, joined sailors in overthrowing the provisional government and placing Lenin and his Bolshevik party in control of what would become the Soviet Union. 